Hey folks and welcome back to the channel. Let me tell you nine cool facts about appendicitis. The first thing is a very distinctive pattern of abdominal pain in appendicitis. So what happens is that it usually starts in the central sort of periumbilical region and then it migrates, it moves, it doesn't radiate to the right iliac fossa. In other words, it picks up and moves to the right iliac fossa, leaving the periumbilical region so the patient doesn't have any pain. Uh, centrally anymore. So this is a very distinctive pattern of abdominal pain in uh, appendicitis, which is worth bearing in mind when you take a history. The next one is the causes and the natural history of appendicitis. There are many different causes, but the commonest ones are usually a fecolith. So this is a hardened piece of stool which can block the, uh, the, the appendix uh, outlet, leading to edema uh, further along. You can also have lymphoid hyperplasia uh, as a result of uh, some sort of infection or, or inflammatory process, or it can be blocked by a tumor in the terminal ileum or the cecum area. The natural history is usually starts with a bit of edema, compromised blood supply or, and ischemia, which then leads to infarction, which then leads to necrosis and tissue death and gangrene and perforation and all bad things that like fecal contamination, peritonitis, and very severe uh, consequences for the patient. The history is uh, usually one of pain, as I said, in the central abdominal area, which is crampy and colicky. Colicky means it's to do with waves of peristalsis, which then migrates to the right iliac fossa. The patient might have diarrhea and a change in bowel habit anorexia, which means loss of appetite. They can also have this thing called fetor, which is very sort of bad smell from the mouth and coated tongue and very flushed. And then they will be maximally tender over the McBurney's point, which I'll come to in a moment, with guarding and rebound tenderness. So guarding essentially means the patient's lying rigid. Uh, this is usually a feature of peritonitis and advanced appendicitis. And they can have rebound tenderness. So you press on the abdomen, and then when you let go, the patient experiences pain. Next up, speaking of McBurney's point, this is a very useful little landmark in appendicitis. And if you draw a line from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine, this is the palpable part of the bony uh, hip, uh, the point about a third and two thirds junction of that area is McBurney's point. And that's roughly where you can find the appendix, and that's roughly where the patient would be maximally tender uh, in appendicitis. Next up, differential diagnosis. What else could it be? But the ones that kind of really shouldn't be missed out are ectopic pregnancy. So in a woman of childbearing age, pregnancy should be ruled out. Mesenteric adenitis. So this is usually in children and younger people uh, following usually an upper respiratory tract infection urinary tract infection, kidney stones, pyelonephritis, things like that, and then a variety of other things like gastroenteritis, Crohn's disease in the terminal ileum, and a variety of other uh, gynecological things that kind of it could also be. Next up, gridiron versus lands, scars, and incisions. So nowadays, most appendicectomies are usually done laparoscopically, but you may see the scar very often, and it's usually in the right iliac fossa, the grid iron is uh, over, usually over McBurney's point, uh, 90 degrees to that line, which connects the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. The grid iron is a muscle cutting incision. So as, as much as possible, people try and avoid that and go for the lands, which is a muscle splitting incision. And it's usually thought to be a little bit more cosmetic um, because it's a bit lower down and it's more horizontal. How do you investigate appendicitis? Essentially, it's a clinical diagnosis. So you take a full and careful history and examine the patient and you sort of decide whether it's appendicitis or not. There are a few other things, so particularly white cell count, so leukocytosis and CRP would be elevated. A pregnancy test is really compulsory in a woman of childbearing age. Urine dip and MSU midstream urine to rule out a kidney stone or hematuria or something like that. And then any imaging, you start with a sort of least invasive and non-irradiating one. So start with an ultrasound. Um, and if there's any doubt still, then you can proceed to a CT scan for really detailed images of the appendix. 
and the surrounding area and the pelvis to see if there is an abscess, for example. As part of your diagnostic workup, you can also use this thing called the Alvadara score. Many people don't sort of formally use it, but it's a useful guide. Uh, there are about eight parameters that uh, point to diagnosis of appendicitis, and you give them a score. Uh, most of them are a score of one, except the leukocytosis and the tenderness over the McPerny's point. And then you get a score, and depending on that, that sort of guides your diagnosis. And usually, if it's seven to 10, then you, you think it probably an operation isn't indicated. If it's shades of gray, five to eight, you kind of admit the patient and observe them for a period of time. And if it's very low likelihood, then you potentially can discharge the patient. Next up is an amazing story about appendicitis, which I came across. And the first time I read about this, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a, I thought it was a wind up, but it's actually a true story about this guy, a surgeon called Leonid Rogozov, uh, in the 60s, who was a, a Russian surgeon. He was 27 at the time, and he um, was on a mission, on an sort of expedition to the South Pole, to the Antarctic. And he, because he was a doctor, he diagnosed himself as having appendicitis. It sort of got a little bit worse. It kind of proceeded to become peritonitis. He recognized that, you know, this was bad, and there was no nobody around. I don't think they could transfer him as easily or as quickly as, as, the, as, as he needed to be. So he took out his own appendix. And it's an extraordinary story when you think about it. He trained all his assistants. He tried to use an aseptic technique as much as possible. He, I think he used an, a mirror initially, but then uh, got rid of it because it was confusing him and disorientating him. But he took out his own appendix and it worked. And here's a picture of him a few years after his return to Russia. It's an extraordinary story, really, when you think about it, of this young man who took out his own appendix and lived to tell the tale. It's an amazing story. And that's why astronauts and kind of cosmonauts, people who go and uh, live in a space station for you know, many weeks and months at a time, they usually get an elective appendicectomy prophylactically. They take their appendix out. They also take their wisdom teeth out, in addition, to, so that you know, they don't have any problems up in space. So that's a little factoid, which I thought was quite interesting. By the way, if you're getting value out of this video and you're finding it interesting, I'd really appreciate it if you can give it a like and a thumbs up. Uh, it really does help. And thank you very much in advance. How do you manage appendicitis? Uh, well, you can do nothing. One is, that's always an option. You can give them some antibiotics and send them home, for example, if the evidence is not strong enough. If it is kind of a bit sort of shades of gray, you can admit them and observe them for a period of time to see how they get on. Uh, you can give them antibiotics, uh, intravenous fluids, antiemetics, analgesics to see kind of how things pan out. If the evidence hardens and they kind of become a bit sicker and so on, then you can go in and do an, a laparoscopic, uh, have a look and, and take out the appendix that way. Or you can just go ahead and do an appendicectomy, open and get the appendix out. And interestingly, about 10 to 20 percent of uh, appendicectomy specimens, in other words, the appendix has been removed, is completely normal. There was no inflammation in it. Complications of appendicectomy, as with anything, you can divide them into so local or systemic. You can divide them into short term and long term. So short term, as with any wound, you can get it infected. Uh, you can also get the uh, appendicectomy site, the stump itself get, can get infected, the ligature can come off, you can get a pelvic abscess and so on and so forth. You can get something called post on ileus. So ileus is a condition where the bowel is just down tools for a period of time. They don't like being handled and touched. So basically the patient just stops peristalsing for a period of time, which can create its own problems. Uh, then it can get UTIs, DVTs, PEs, risks of anesthetic. Um, general anesthetic, risks of bleeding, all sorts of other things. Longer term, you can get adhesions. These are scar tissue bands within the abdomen that can uh, kind of cause further problems down the line with bowel obstruction, for example. You can get a hernia in the wound site, so you can get an incisional hernia, especially more, you know, particularly more common with a gridiron incision, and also you can have a scar. But again, most of the Appendicectomies, thankfully, these days are done laparoscopically, so that obviously that minimizes the risk of a scar. Hope you found this useful. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.